Chapter 4 Forensics were in the room now, looking for the rest of the clues that might piece together who exactly had been there. The corpse of John O'Toole was taken away in a body bag by the coroner to be given a post-mortem before being readied for a funeral. For some reason, Electra remembered a conversation she had with John when he worked for the police station about their bodies after death. Electra had always wanted to be cremated, as there was precious little land spare for more and more graveyards. John wanted to be buried, so his body could give nutrients back to the soil. Life delivering life. Augustine's mind was somewhere else. He wondered what would happen to O'Toole's eyes. Would they be popped back into the sockets? Put in his top pocket for safekeeping? Or would they travel in a separate container to the rest of the body? He had no idea why his mind wandered to the obscure in times like this. He settled on the fact they would be put into a pocket somewhere on John O'Toole's clothing, ready for the coroner to take out when he was ready. Electra waited with Augustine for the forensics report, which would be the next step in their particular part of the investigation. Across the corridor, Gary was talking to receptionist number one, who had been on shift for the first half of the night. They had quite a large window to work with at that time, before the time of death could be accurately established, but that wasn't a problem. Having more information was a lesser problem than not having enough. They could sift through and cut down if needed at a later point. What time did you break off your shift? Oh, it is about ten past midnight. We have a handover, so Petra comes in just before midnight and I go just after. That way we can talk about anything that needs to be done. I think we're supposed to sit here and be a point of reference for any guests that come down or call reception, but so very little happens at that time of night. So we make sure that there are things to do that get us through to the next morning. You know, cleaning, paperwork, stuff like that. The first receptionist answered. Gary hadn't asked her name, but now knew that the other receptionist, the one he was still to talk to, was called Petra. He didn't have a great knowledge about what names meant, but he was sure it had something to do with Stone. Hopefully she would be more forthcoming than the Stone when he got to speak to her. And did you see anything suspicious at the time? Not a thing. The level of her certainty put Gary at unease. Everyone sees something they don't think quite right, don't they? Actually, there was something. Perhaps they do. There was a rubbish bag left in the entrance as I went home. It was quite heavy. I just put it in a dumpster around the side, but it didn't make sense that it was there, she said in a matter-of-fact tone. Wait there a moment. Gary ran out of the room and across the corridor to the room where Augustine and Electro were talking, managing to avoid the desk, door handles and several other obstacles on his way. Boyle, the rubbish bag's in the big bin out the back. One was left in the entrance, probably worth checking, Gary uttered, a little out of breath, before running back in the opposite direction to continue talking to the receptionist. What's your name? He started back with a question he should have asked earlier. I'm Bella Burton. Didn't they tell you that? Probably, but I'd like to hear everything from you rather than a third party. Do you have a criminal record? Bella. Gary didn't know why the question came into his head. He just decided it was relevant. No, not at all. I think this is probably the first time in my life I've ever spoken to someone who works for the police. Why do you ask? Just wanted to know. It's all part of the job, see. The chances of someone committing a crime are quite low. The chances of someone who has already committed a crime committing another is much higher. Even murder? Bella asked. Even murder. So, you checked this guy in, uh, John O'Toole? Yes, pretty much a normal transaction, except for the fact that he didn't book in advance and paid in cash. We don't get many walk-ins from the streets anymore, especially on the outskirts of town. When I worked in the Liverpool City Centre Campanile, we would get loads of people who walk in off the streets, and lots of them would pay cash, but uh, not here. And did he have luggage? 
Yes, I'm pretty sure he had a case with him. Thought it was quite a big case for a one-night stay, but he's not the only one. Some people bring their own kettles, hair dryers, and all sorts, even though we have them all in the rooms. Thought maybe he was one of them. Gary finished up with Bella and quickly checked with Augustine to see if he had checked the rubbish container for the bag that might carry clues. No such luck. A bag of takeaway rubbish, probably from a local shop that didn't want to pay for their own bin collection. Did we recover a case from the room? He had one with him when he checked in. Gary asked, looking at Augustine with one sentence and then Electra with the other. He didn't know where to look when he was addressing two people, so tried to address both. Augustine looked at Electra. She looked back without any indication she had an answer. Not sure, but we'll look into it. Don't remember it being mentioned at all, Augustine responded, and headed up to the room where John O'Toole's body had been found. Back to Petra, Gary went through the motions asking questions, getting bland answers that led him nowhere. Gary liked the cut and thrust of the interview, but much preferred one with a potential murderer than a bored receptionist that had seen nothing at all. Ash was better suited to this. Finished with the two receptionists for now, Gary looked through his notes and made corrections where he had missed or rushed a piece of information. There would be full statements taken by a uniformed police officer soon after, but Gary needed information to report back to the team. That way, they could get their heads together and kickstart the investigation. He walked slowly, deliberately, through to the room where Augustine was directing operations. The look on Augustine's face was one of confusion. No case, no back, no possessions other than what was about his person, but a wallet full of twenties was still there. Oh, not sure where we're going with this, but the missing case looks pretty important, don't you think? Augustine uttered. Yes, yes boss. Boyle. Electra and Gary replied at the exact same time, but with slightly different responses. They blended into one. Let's take a look at the CCTV, shall we? The same response from the two of them. Augustine had been trained in the police way of progressing conversations. The first thing you had to do was get people agreeing and nodding their heads. Then they would start to feel like you, and they are linked. The more you get someone nodding their head, the more likely you were to get their agreement. Build trust and you build bridges. This worked in community policing, interviewing suspects, and talking to the team. Augustine loved it.